Glenn de Bouton, the author of a new book, The Constellations of Philosophy. What do you mean by the constellations of philosophy? Well, it's really alluding to a project that certain philosophers have had in the history of philosophy, by no means all, and that is the idea that philosophy can, in some way, uh, cheer you up, make you happier, console you, um, that there's a practical application to philosophy. Uh, it's a minority uh, school of, uh, of thought in philosophy because most philosophers are not interested in everyday life. Um, and yet it seemed to me that there was a tradition of uh, certain thinkers who were concerned and what I set out to do in my book was to throw a spotlight on their work. They're all major philosophers, but um, they are often neglected uh, in academic circles. They're not the philosophers that one can study. And um, so it seemed important to, to, to shine a light on them. I should say up front that uh, there are six philosophers you focus on yes. in no particular order. Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, Montaigne, Socrates, Epicurus, and Seneca. Exactly. And we'll talk about each of them. But um, why did you pick these six as opposed to another six? Sure. Um, partly it was because I loved, the, I loved reading them. Um, so it was a kind of uh, a personal love affair going on there. Um, partly also because, as I said, the definition of the project was that it should be philosophers who are concerned with everyday life. And there isn't an infinite range of philosophers. Um, I couldn't have written an essay on Kant within the context of the consolations of philosophy, at least it seemed to me. So. Um, you know, I think that they, they came fairly easily to mind. And uh, what's nice about all these philosophers um, is that they write well, and they're very much united in the idea that it's not just what you say, but how you say it that's important. So they're a pleasure to read. Are you a philosopher? Uh, hmm. uh, probably not, because uh, I do a lot of writing in, in other areas as well. And uh, nowadays, I suppose, the only people who really call themselves philosophers are people on you know, who, who earn all their living from doing philosophy, probably in an academic department. Well, Though what? I have some loose association uh, with a, an academic post, it doesn't take up enough time for me to stand up and call myself a philosopher. Although, of course, you know, we should take advice from Socrates, uh, who suggests that we are all philosophers and that the unexamined life is not worth living. So, um, to answer your question Socratically, not only am I a philosopher, but you are too and everyone else in this room. So, um, yeah. And what is philosophy? Well, uh, I think as conceived of by uh, someone like Socrates, it would be uh, very loosely defined, simply a logical way of thinking. Um, so philosophy identifies itself not so much by uh, its subject matter as by its method, um, so that it's, it's a method of approaching questions in a logical, rational uh, way, uh, attempting to define terms and to move smoothly from one point to another, etc. Et so it distinguishes itself from ordinary muddle thinking in which you know, we don't say what we mean and uh, talking rather like I'm talking now. So, um, yeah, to be, a, to be a philosopher for someone like Socrates, it just means to make sense and to try and strive for coherence in what one's saying. Is that what it means for all of these six? Um, because it sounds like you mean, you're saying that philosophy means clear thinking. Yes. Um, I think all the six throw a different emphasis on certain things. So, for example, Seneca and the Stoic school to which he belonged, um, he envisaged philosophy as a, a discipline that's designed to assist you to cope with frustration. And it's, it's, it's um, his responsibility why we still use the word philosophical as a way to suggest, you know, that someone is taking something well, taking a disaster well, you know, I'm, I'm being philosophical about the house, the fact that my house has burnt down. Um, this conception of what philosophy is dates back to the Stoic school. So you're right to say that there are differences in emphasis. Um, although I think all the philosophers I look at are essentially united in the idea that thinking can help um, in various ways. There are things you can do in your mind um, which are worth doing. Comment on, on my experience, and that is when I was in college, generally speaking, it was the philosophy majors who were pitied as the ones who were wasting their education because upon graduation they would not be employed. Yes. Um, well, I don't, think, I don't think the fact that they're not going to be employed is, by definition means that their course was a waste of time. Um, my criticism of most philosophy courses is that they do concentrate on some pretty arid subjects. And um, though I think there's a, a, a need to study logic and epistemology and metaphysics, uh, I think there's also a need to study kind of ethical questions, questions of everyday life as well. And I think that this is an area that is neglected by most, um, by most philosophy departments, which is why they unfairly gain a uh, or perhaps slightly fairly gain a reputation as uh, laughing stocks. You are originally from where? From Switzerland. 
Is there a different approach to the teaching or even the inclusion of philosophy in schooling in the, on the continent as opposed to the United States that you know of? Uh, not in Switzerland, but I do know that in France, um, um, I think when you're from 16 to 18, you are taught philosophy. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure how much of a good idea this is because uh, it means that a lot of French people will tell you five things about Descartes, which they picked up just before doing their... Uh, they're, they're back, um, but uh, but uh, maybe it's a start. Maybe it's a start. Um, you've identified uh, some of the aspects of philosophy that are, are relevant, and they're all listed in the, um, I guess it's the contents page yeah. of your book. You address unpopularity, not having enough money, frustration, inadequacy, a broken heart, and difficulties. Which came first, the philosophers in your mind to address these or these issues to address these philosophers? Well, what I wanted to do in my book was not so much write an introduction, a kind of general introduction to philosophy, because that seemed <coughs> a task that hundreds of others have, have done quite well. Uh, it seemed important to me to drive one question through each philosopher's thought, so not to try and say everything about them, but to try and um, pick out one uh, consoling dimension to their thought. Um, and really, what it took for, was for me to read these philosophers and then ask myself, what do I think is really interesting here? What do I think really helps here? So um, I guess I started with a philosopher and then wound up with a conception of what it was that uh, I felt was really at the core of their work. Well, let's start then uh, with Socrates, as you did. Who was he? When did he live? Uh, well, he lived in, uh, in ancient Athens. He was a... Uh, we know very... First of all, we know not that much about him because... Uh, he never wrote anything down, so what we know of him has come down to us through uh, Plato's dialogues. Uh, Plato was a, a pupil of uh, Socrates. Um, he uh, led a very unusual life. He never wore any sandals. Uh, he, it was said that he'd been born in order to spite shoemakers. He wore a dirty cloak throughout the year. Uh, it was very rare to, for him to have a bath. Um, and he was a kind of an outsider figure in ancient Athens. And what he would do is to go up to important figures in the marketplace and basically ask them, to explain the meaning of life. Um, and by this, really, um, you know, one has in mind the, the idea of someone who is asking people uh, to explain why they're living a certain way. Um, you know, why is it that they value one thing and not another? Why is it that they're taking something seriously but neglecting something else? He would, he would go up to people and say, you know, explain to me what virtue is, or uh, explain what courage is, or, uh, you know, why do you believe that making money is important, etc. And many people were very annoyed by this kind of uh, constant provocation, this, this need to think uh, about things. But it was essential to Socrates' project. And I think what one, you know, you can ask, well, what is interesting about this man? And um, I think he's the first person to make a distinction, which is key, between truth and opinion. He believed that there is, on the one side, the truth, which is something that you've thought about rationally, logically, and have really tried to understand. And then there's opinion, which is our intuition, stuff we pick up in the marketplace. Um, and he believed that philosophy must ally itself, must try to ally itself to the truth and um, stand up against uh, mere opinion. Um, so, you know, it's possible to say that 98% of Americans believe X and nowadays in our own culture we think, oh, well, then, then X must be right. Um, Socrates' answer would be, well, hang on, what we need to do is to try and systematically analyze what this position is and it may be that 98% um, of Americans are simply wrong. So I think he lends us courage to uh, defend certain minority opinions so long as we've thought about them properly. He, uh, he, he lets us imagine that many of the opinions that are dominant in our culture might be wrong or at least very muddled. And uh, this is why he's proved a source of great inspiration to people facing opposition uh, uh, throughout the centuries. What is the Socratic method? Well, the Socratic method of thinking is, is really uh, a distillation of the kind of mental maneuvers that Socrates seemed to be engaged in when he talked to Ath Athenians in the marketplace. And um, really what it boils down to is an attempt to question um, common sense and to try and disprove it or at least try and find exceptions to it. So, you know, a typical thing might be, you know, someone, uh, you take a common sense belief like, you know, money will make you happy. Um, now, the Socratic method would be to take that statement and think, well, okay, can I, can I show any exceptions to this statement? Is this statement really true? Or are there certain situations where that statement will not be true? And one could say, yes, you know, if you've got no friends, but you've got a lot of money, uh, you're unlikely to be very happy. So already there's a kind of, 
not necessarily that that statement is wrong, but there's an imprecision. And uh, the Socratic method is an attempt to refine rather baggy, loose, imprecise uh, definitions um, that, that are bandied about in common sense conversations, to so try and sharpen them by trying to find exceptions to them. Um, it may sound like a relatively tedious process. In a way, it's, it's common sense, um, but it's common sense made explicit. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's what, um, that's what we find at the heart of, Plato's con of, of uh, Socrates' conversations, as recorded by Plato. You hear the phrase, the Socratic method, used most frequently in describing how law school classes are taught. Is that the Socratic method that Socrates himself used, as far as you know? I don't know about law school classes, I confess, so I, I, don't, I don't know. How did this man make his living? Um, he didn't really. Uh, it's unclear. Um, first of all, he had not very much money at all. It was possible to live cheaply in ancient Athens. Life was not expensive. But um, he frequently lived off his friends. His friends thought he was the wisest man that ever lived and hence were, were keen to you know, give him food and shelter and, uh, and help, to, uh, help to raise his children. So um, he, he did not have a, uh, a nine to five. We'll talk about the city of Athens and why this I guess he just did literally wander around town and he talked to people. Absolutely. So why is he now a man that we're now talking about, what, 2,500 years later? Um, because I guess he made some very important points for the first time and he made them very well and um, what, he, what he stood up for remains very valuable to us. He's really a, an emblem of someone thinking independently, someone thinking against the uh, the, the opinions of the majority and the will of the crowd. Um, he's someone who engaged in the questions of uh, you know, daily life. He went out, as you say, into the marketplace of Athens and questioned people. And, um, and yet, um, uh, you know, w w what he came up with um, was enormously uh, you know, powerful statements of, of principle, really, like the unexamined life not being worth living, etc. And this, this remains applicable today. And what was his, you mentioned, that Plato wrote about him, but what was the relationship between Plato and Socrates? Again, it's, it's, it's a little bit unclear, but basically we, we know that Plato was one of uh, Socrates' pupils. Um, he was quite a bit younger uh, than, uh, than Socrates. He's likely to have witnessed, Plato's likely to have witnessed uh, the, the scene of, uh, of, of Socrates' trial uh, in Athens in 399 BC, uh, and was very impressed and shocked by the fact that Athens put Socrates to death famously ordered him to, uh, to drink hemlock. Um, and uh, Plato wanted to do justice to Socrates' legacy. Uh, Plato had been enormously impressed by Socrates' conversations and wanted to record them for posterity, which he did. Therefore, there's no book written by Socrates. There's no book, um, because Socrates' uh, opposition to books is rather interesting. It's not just that he omitted to write books, it's that he believed that there's a problem with books. Uh, he believed that what's wrong with books is that it's very possible to, for an author to write a book, but then not be assured of what the, um, what the reader is taking in from the book. And so one can get a kind of false sense of satisfaction from being a writer. So he believed it was very important to have head-to-head, -head, sort of face-to-face -face conversations with people, um, so as to be sure that they are not simply um, uh, you know, taking knowledge in passively, but engaging with it and taking it in a deep way. Uh, and this is why Socrates refused to call himself a teacher. He didn't want to, to see himself as someone handing down great truths. He wanted to guide people to find truth for themselves rather than uh, simply give them answers. He wanted to set them asking questions, which is why he preferred to describe himself as a midwife. And uh, just as midwives help to bring children uh, into the world, so Socrates uh, saw himself as a midwife of thoughts. He wanted to help Athenians to deliver better thoughts, healthy thoughts. He seems to be a benchmark on philosophers only because you hear in philosophy about the pre-Socratic philosophers and then I guess the post-Socratic. So why is, is he that benchmark and how was philosophy different before him? Well, um, Plutarch uh, uh, said that, um, that what Socrates' unique contribution was to have brought philosophy down from the skies uh, and to make it mingle uh, in the lives of ordinary Athenians. Uh, that was Plutarch's view. And um, I think that's on the whole quite right, that the pre-Socratics are not concerned with questions of everyday life, they're not concerned with questions of ethics. They are closer, I suppose, to what one would now describe as scientists. They're speculating on um, how the earth works, um, why the sun uh, rises every morning, 
um, what air is made of, what water is composed of, etc. Et They're concerned really with scientific questions. Um, and then along comes Socrates and brings this kind of more scientific rigor to bear on questions of everyday life. And that is seen as his unique contribution uh, and, 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 and also his, his great value. If we were to run across a real Socrates today, mm. what would he look like, where would he be, and what would he do? Well, um, <clears throat> I suppose one thing we can be sure that he'd be doing would be to get us to focus more closely on everyday assumptions. Um, so in that sense, he might have a chat show on TV, uh, mm. but, uh, but it would, like, it would be you know, likely to be a, a rather rigorous conversation in which he would be grilling his guests, not simply in a, in a sort of uselessly combative way, if just to help to drive ratings, but in a genuine search for the truth. And one can imagine his programs lasting for hours on end with no commercial breaks as he tries to <laughs> lead his interlocutors to the truth. So he, um, yes, he might not get huge ratings, but I think we can imagine him being, um, I mean, he described himself as a gadfly on the, uh, uh, of Athens, um, and, uh, and I think he'd be a gadfly to our own society as well, and he, he might do this from any number of positions. Tell the story of his death, the circumstances leading up to it, and the trial. Right. Well, he was... And as you do so, I just want to show the audience the picture from your book that uh, depicts uh, his death. Right. Because that is, of course, a, a, a famous uh, picture by uh, uh, David, uh, which hangs in the Met in New York. Um, basically, what happened is that Socrates uh, was um, uh, called up for trial by a couple of pri uh, three private citizens who believed that he'd been um, corrupting the youth of Athens. and. Uh, they thought that uh, he was an immoral influence on the young and should be tried and possibly put to death. Um, the philosopher had made himself quite unpopular by going up to people and asking them these big questions. He'd annoyed people. One could imagine him being really quite annoying. He'd, uh, he'd, he'd, he, a lot of the young people had imitated his questioning methods and had gone home and asked, started asking their parents certain things, like, why are you living this way? Why is this important? Why not that? And uh, generally, he was seen to be a, a dangerous influence. Uh, Athens had lost a lot of her power in the few years before, uh, Athen uh, before Socrates was called to trial. Um, uh, Athens had, had, had been the loser in the Peloponnesian War, and many people blamed this figure of Socrates, this strange man wandering bare feet, barefooted around uh, Athens, for basically depressing the young and, uh, and being a malign influence. So he was called up to trial, and um, he was accused of all sorts of uh, terrible things. He defended himself in rather a high-handed way. Uh, he was told that he could save his life if he stopped philosophizing, if he basically shut up. And he refused to. He said, I must carry on philosophizing. You know, even if this means that I will die, I must carry on. And because of this high-handed approach, the jurors voted to put him to death. He was taken off to jail uh, and uh, a few weeks later uh, was forced to drink hemlock and, um, and died a very noble and courageous death, which has continued to inspire uh, uh, painters down the, uh, down the centuries. And the picture you depict was just one of several that have been... Right, there are many. There are, there are hundreds of versions of the death of Socrates. In the, in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, every, every sort of decent painter would turn out a death of Socrates. Um, this was simply seen as one of the subjects that you would have to turn out, which is enormously moving, really, certainly fascinating to think that the death of this philosopher was a serious uh, sort of obsession uh, you know, for a couple of centuries. Um, what was the uh, fate of his accusers? Well, uh, a few years later, they were, well, we're told by Plutarch that they were lynched um, and that they were driven from Athens. Uh, uh, another t story tells us they committed suicide because no one would talk to them. Uh, basically, uh, quite soon after Socrates' death, Athens realized that it had made a big mistake. Um, and I think that what's inspiring in Socrates' story is the idea that a belief which at one point is seen as ridiculous and absurd can, within a short amount of time, gradually win people over. And so I think that Socrates lends us encouragement to to keep faith with certain ideas, even if at the very beginning, in the short term, no one else seems to agree. The second philosopher you addressed is Epicurus, and you've associated him uh, with not having enough money. Your book, if we read his chapter, is to console us if we don't have enough money. Who was he? When did he live? Right. Again, we know very little about Epicurus, just a few fragments. Uh, he, he came about a hundred years after Socrates. He was born on a small island of Samos, just off the coast of Turkey, and came to Athens as a young man. What immediately distinguished Epicurus's uh, philosophy was that he said categorically that the most important thing in life was pleasure. And when people heard this, they immediately imagined they understood what uh, Epicurus had in mind. Uh, they imagined him leading a kind of lotus-eating lifestyle and uh, 
uh, being addicted to luxury and orgies and banquets because he kept saying the most important thing in life is pleasure. And even today we have this idea that to be an Epicurean means um, you know, having a very lavish lifestyle. I recently heard about a, a deli in Miami uh, called the Epicurean, which apparently serves choice cuts of meat and expensive produce. And uh, you know, there's, there's a restaurant in England also called uh, the Epicurean, a luxury restaurant. Um, so this idea of uh, Epicurus as a, a promoter of a, of a wealthy uh, and, 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 and rather decadent life is, is popular. Um, it's a complete error. Uh, Epicurus did say that the most important thing in life was pleasure. However, he believed that if you analyze what truly brings pleasure, it can often be things very far removed from what we imagine pleasure uh, to be when we're reading you know, a, a glossy magazine. So he stood out against this view that um, pleasure is easily attained through material goods. And he came up with certain goods which he believed really are necessary uh, for happiness. Um, and fortunately for anyone lacking enough money. Stop there. Uh, what is the difference between pleasure and happiness? Well, uh, Epicurus doesn't make that much of a distinction between the two. Um, later philosophers have. For Epicurus, the, these words are, are, are interchangeable, i.e. a pleasurable life um, will lead you to a happy life, and a happy life contains pleasure. So um, he, he's not, uh, he doesn't draw a distinction. All right, then you were about to identify certain goods he associated with happiness. That's right. So you don't need the house, you don't need you know, the, the big car, you don't need to shop at the Epicurean deli and get the best cuts of meat. What you do need, however, is some friends. He thought it was absolutely essential to have friends. He's rather touching uh, as a philosopher in stressing just how important friends are. He took this insight, not just you know, casually or ritualistically, but he took it very seriously in that he himself um, set up home with a group of friends. He began what I guess could best be described as a commune. Um, he lived with a group of friends. He said that to eat a single meal without a friend is the life of a lion or a wolf. He believed that what makes people human is their capacity for friendship and that it's, a, it's the greatest source of, 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 our, of our joy. Um, uh, and um, so he began this commune. He also believed that it was very important to be self-sufficient, to lead a self-sufficient life uh, because um, he thought that uh, being enthralled to kind of odious superiors can be a serious source of distress. So he believed that we should kind of withdraw from the commercial world in order to set up a commune, what could best be described, I suppose, as a commune. And it's interesting that Karl Marx wrote his PhD thesis on Epicurus. So um, the idea of an Epicurean uh, commune in which people are living simply but living among friends is, has, uh, has had a long hold on, I guess, the Western imagination. The other thing that Epicurus thought was essential is to lead an analyzed life. Uh, he believed that our anxieties are on the whole disproportionate to um, what there really is to worry about and that anxiety is uh, what occurs in the mind when certain problems have not been approached uh, rationally and calmly. So um, he thought that with a life in which you have friends, you're self-sufficient and you're doing a lot of analyzing, uh, that these are the essential ingredients of happiness and that if you have these ingredients but you're lacking the big villa, you can never shop at the Epicurean, etc., etc., this is not going to make you unhappy. Um, unhappiness is too strong a word for what you might experience if you lack, you know, this kind of uh, luxury. Um, however, he believed that if you do have all the luxury, you have the big car, the big house, blah, blah, blah. He wouldn't have said car, obviously, but he might, you know, that's an extension. Um, he believed that, you know, if you had all these goods and yet lacked his three goods, you, you could not be happy. Just to put an edge on this, uh, freedom means basically not having a boss, not working in a hierarchy, something like that? Yes. And, and thought means what? That you should meditate every day? Or? That you should analyze your, the sources of your distress. You should analyze all pain. For example? Uh, for example, let's imagine that someone is very worried about death. This was a key Epicurean thing. Um, we all worry a lot about death. Uh, Epicurus believed that it, it's very important to happiness to face death head on at all times, at all ages, and he comes up with various arguments which he believes that if we, um, you know, if we learn to see death in a certain way, we will stop fearing it so much. He asks us to imagine, for example, that death is rather like the time before we were born. And he says, well, what was so bad about the time before we were born? We didn't feel it, we didn't know about it. He asks us to think that death is going to be the same way, so that there is nothing that we need to fear in death. And um, that's just one very small example of the kind of uh, attempt to rationalize our fears that Epicurus thought was absolutely essential to happiness. 
I want you to analyze two graphs in your book. I have to hold it here so everybody sure. can see. But this one is uh, an XY axis, and it's headed relation of happiness to money for someone with friends, freedom, and so forth, the goods you have identified. Sure. And this axis, the X axis, is level of happiness. Y is amount of money spent. That's right. And what we see on the graph is that um, if you've got these Epicurean goods, you know, you've got the friends, etc., etc., what you find is that your level of happiness rises very early on in the income scale. You see that there's not that much money that you need before you your level up. of happiness shoots way up. All, all you need is money enough to buy you clothing and shelter. That's all you need. You don't need you know, anything that expensive. And then uh, Epicurus thought that however much money you have, you don't get more happy. A flat There's line. A flat line. So you shoot up quite quickly. So uh, over here I'm a billionaire. You're a billionaire and you're no happier than you if you, you know, if you've got if this. I'm a thousandaire. Exactly. All right. Exactly. The next chart is the relevant one, uh, related one. So it's for the billionaire? Yes. It's the unhappy billionaire. The heading is relation of happiness to money for someone without friends, freedom, and so forth. And what we see is that, um, again, you know, the graph shoots up a little bit when, you, when you're able to, uh, to buy the basics. But thereafter, however much money you have, your graph of happiness stays relatively low so that the billionaire is not getting much happiness because he's sitting alone in his big villa with no friends. In the book you mentioned he wrote 300 books, mm -hmm. approximately. Approximately. How do we know that, and are they real books of the, dur of the length that you've written and others? Uh, no, they would be shorter, because uh, books were shorter. They were scrolls in those days, and so they would, they, 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 he would have written 350 scrolls, uh, which were described as books. Uh, we know this from uh, the biographer Diogenes Laertius, who wrote the lives of the philosophers and recorded many events in Epicurus's life, and so we know this. We also know that the books were, were largely lost, although a few inscriptions remain, and some letters remain. This, what, to what extent do you think that uh, this consolation that you've written is just a, a way to talk yourself into being happy with your economic failure? Um, well, that's a very interesting question. You know, is this is this simply denial of uh, our legitimate desire uh, for you know material goods? Is this simply an attempt to, as you say, you know, feel good about something that um, you know that, that really is necessary? Um, I think that there is something. I think that Epicurus clearly is onto something very interesting. We may not want to drive the argument as far as he did, but it is undeniable that there are plenty of uh, uh, examples of people who've had enormous financial success and yet they're not happy. That they have associated uh, a happy life with uh, material satisfaction, and yet there's a problem. I mean, this is almost a cliche of what's happened in Western consumer society, that we've placed an awful lot of emphasis on acquiring goods, and yet what we find is that our graph of happiness has remained stubbornly low. And this is kind of the great paradox and the great sort of irony of consumer society. What is going wrong? Why is it that um, people in you know, shanty towns in India seem to be no less happy? said uh, than people in you know, wealthy suburbs of the United States in you know according to certain research and etc even if we don't swallow the whole thing there's definitely something going on and it's on this territory that Epicurus is interesting and relevant because he is one of the first people to point out that um, really that our material desires frequently hide and make up for and disguise certain psychological needs that are unattended um, and I think this remains a very relevant point did he lead an aesthetic life, or did he lead one of luxury? Um, he led, I suppose, a modest life that had certain uh, little moments of luxury. Uh, I think Epicurus would have been someone who appreciated the small things of life. So in one letter, he thanks a friend for sending him a feast, because the friend sent him, a, sent him a, a pot of delicious cheese, which he's just had. So a little bit of cheese was for Epicurus a feast. Um, uh, other Epicureans, um, um, uh, were known to have led really quite simple lives, but rather as aesthetically attractive lives. So um, I like to imagine the Epicureans leading a kind of life out of a, a Dutch still life, sort of sim modest and simple, but somehow uh, beautiful and aesthetic too. What would be Epicur the Epicurean take on an advertising campaign in the United States that says, it's not just your car, it's your freedom? Yes, I mean, that's, that's fascinating because if one reads uh, advertising through an Epicurean lens, one comes up with all sorts of fascinating things. So many adverts, as you say, point out, um, you know, they will try and sell you a car and they'll say freedom is the greatest thing. Or, uh, you know, there'll be a, there's, a, there's a perfume called actually freedom, um, a kind of aftershave, which is called freedom. And, um, and I just the, the, interrupt, from your own book, you've got an example of an advertisement 
Bacardi and friends. Bacardi, exactly. And what you see is some friends having a lovely time on a boat. Now, the Epicurean analysis of that uh, advert is quite simple. What you see in that advert is um, the way that something that we really need, i.e. friendship, is being co-opted uh, into selling us something that we don't really, so that we'll end up thinking that there is something about Bacardi that is great and is going to make us happy, because we've essentially been lured to Bacardi by an unconscious recognition that what we need is friendship. The danger is that we'll end up with a crate of Bacardi in our living room feeling quite <laughs> unhappy and friendless, so we must take care. The third philosopher you mentioned is Seneca. You associate him uh, with frustration and, and his thinkings as a consolation for frustration. Who was he? Where did he live? Okay, an, an ancient uh, Roman uh, statesman uh, lived in the time of uh, the emperors Caligula and Nero. Um, and uh, it was a time when the Roman Empire was extremely mighty, uh, and, but also where life in ancient Rome was very unstable, so that one could suddenly make a lot of money but lose it all of a sudden if one fell out of favor. Um, uh, the Roman Empire was also racked by many natural disasters. Sudden fires destroyed the city of Lyon. Um, uh, Mount Vesuvius exploded. Uh, Pompeii was destroyed. There were earthquakes uh, in Calabria and Liguria. Um, and what, what Seneca built his philosophy around was attempting to suggest that um, we had to be prepared for disaster and by being prepared would be better able to withstand it. So his philosophy is about literally teaching us to be philosophical about things that go wrong and be, to be more prepared. Um, Seneca, rather like Socrates, came to an unfortunate end. He was ordered to commit suicide by the Emperor Nero and rather like uh, Socrates, he, the scene of his death, the scene of his calmly taking death has continued to inspire uh, painters and uh, uh, David a few years before he painted Socrates meeting his death um, painted a, 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 a canvas of uh, Seneca meeting his death. And we see it here and there are others but you earlier said that um, Seneca was a Stoic. That's right. Where did that word come from, and what is a Stoic? Well, a Stoic uh, is a, uh, is a, uh, it was a school of uh, philosophy founded by a man called Zeno. Um, he, uh, Zeno had started philosophizing uh, in, in the Stoa in Athens. A Stoa was literally a kind of covered marketplace, market area, and he was teaching his pupils there. And so people described uh, Zeno and his uh, followers as Stoics. And, um, but what soon distinguished the Stoics was this idea that um, uh, what it was very important to do was to uh, uh, moderate uh, your responses to disaster and be prepared for disaster. And that's why we still today have this image of what it is to take something stoically. And how do you take something stoically? Uh, well, one view is that you take it with a stiff upper lip, that's rather pejorative, yeah. but the other view is simply that you're, uh, you take it um, with equanimity. You talk about frustration. So you, the right. consolation, if we learn about Seneca, is what in dealing with frustration? Right. Well, um, what Seneca looks at is a number of areas in which people react badly to frustration. And he tries to suggest better ways, uh, better ways to cope with frustration and tries to analyze why we're frustrated. So in one book, he considers the subject of anger, why it is that people feel angry. And Seneca believes that if you scratch the surface of any angry person, you'll find a tremendous optimist. Um, so the person who gets angry when they lose their keys in the morning is basically betraying a rather touching but rather naive view uh, of a world in which keys simply don't get lost. The person who shouts when there's a traffic jam is betraying an implicit faith in a world in which you know, cars don't get clogged up in roads. So um, what Seneca thought it was essential to do is to redraw our map of reality so as to take into account many of the uh, things that do frustrate us so that they'll, be, they'll shock us less when they occur. Uh, to this end, he counseled us to perform what he called a premeditation every morning. That is a, a meditation on all the kinds of things that could go wrong in the day ahead. Uh, he told us to, uh, uh, at one point rather humorously, to, that we should swallow a toad every morning uh, if we, uh, uh, if we, so, that, so as to not see anything more disgusting in the day ahead. Uh, we would be well prepared. And generally his view is the more prepared we are for what might go wrong, be it lost keys or indeed a, a traffic jam, the better we'll be able to respond when uh, that disaster occurs. So it's a kind of, it's, 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 a, it's a philosophy of uh, disappointing yourself uh, rather than letting the world do so, but disappointing yourself in, in a measured way and in a way that um, you're in control of rather than letting life slap you in the face suddenly and hence provoke bitterness and rage. I want to read a little piece of the um, premeditatio, mm -hmm. uh, the Latin of the premeditation that you uh, exempt, exempt for your book. The wise will start each day with the thought, 
fortune gives us nothing which we can really own, nothing, whether public or private, is stable. The destinies of men, no less than those of cities, are in a whirl. Whatever structure has been reared by a long sequence of years at the cost of great toil through the kindness of the gods is scattered and dispersed in a single day. No, he who has said a day has granted too long a postponement to swift misfortune, an hour, an instant of time suffices for the overflow of empires. So we're supposed to recite something like this every day. Th that's the kind of flavor of, of right. Seneca's own thoughts, yeah. It sounds like a real downer. It is, well, it is a downer, but, um, but I think, you know, Seneca believed that it, it vitally prepares you. And I think one, you know, uh, it could sound extreme like that. I mean, um, um, Seneca says at one point, you know, to mortals have you given birth, um, uh, and, and, you know, mortal have you been born, so that you, could, you should expect everything and reckon on everything. And this might sound quite extreme, but, I mean, you know, there are more uh, uh, common sense examples of this. I mean, whenever one approaches an airport, whenever I approach an airport anyway, uh, I go through a little Seneca premeditation, which is, you know, perhaps I'm about to head for some terrible disaster. A, the plane may crash, but even less catastrophically, there may be the most terrible delay. Um, and that helps me to keep calm, because indeed often one is struck by sudden disasters at airports. Um, and uh, and if so long as one's slightly prepared for this, I mean, if one approaches an airport and thinks, I will get to, you know, Washington DC on time, I will be at my gate precisely when, um, you know, the travel agent told me I would be. Uh, one's likely to be really in a rage or, or feel very bitter about the fact that one's constantly slightly delayed. And uh, so it's simply by preparing yourself for the kind of necessary imperfectibility of existence that you help to avoid some of the frustrations. You mentioned his use of hyperbole in his writings. What was that about? Well, I mean, he's, he's, he's prone to uh, all sorts of uh, exclamations. I don't know if I can uh, give you an example of the kind of uh, ex sort of uh, uh, rather florid passages. He, he tells us, uh, uh, he, he talks about the figure of fortune uh, determining our life. And he says, whenever anyone falls at your side or behind you, cry out, fortune, you will not deceive me. You will not fall upon me confident and heedless. I know what you're planning. It's true that you struck someone else, but you aimed at me. So he's kind of, you know, it's almost like theater. And indeed, Seneca wrote plays, a very good plays too. Um, uh, and, uh, and one can get the sense that, um, that Seneca is concerned to convey his philosophy in very dramatic, theatrical, literary terms. He believes that it's not just, you know, he can't just make a point rationally. He has to use rhetoric, um, and he has to use all the powers of art to bring home his message. And I think that's a very interesting view of what is philosophers should do. Is that in contrast to some of the other philosophers you've mentioned? Not the philosophers that I look at, but it's certainly in contrast to modern day philosophers who have a view that you know you can write more or less as though you're writing a kind of manual for a car when you're writing a book of philosophy because as so long as the thought is nice um, it doesn't matter how you say it. Uh, Seneca had a much more I think realistic picture of the way our minds work which is that if you give someone a, a lively image if you try and help them with the use of metaphor and language you're very much going to help them to understand an argument and to let that argument continue to be a living presence in their mind. Well tell the story of the politics of Rome at the time and how he got caught up in it. Well, uh, Seneca did come to uh, some sticky moments. Um, he was accused by the uh, Empress Messalina of having uh, 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 had an affair with uh, the, uh, the sister of, um, of uh, uh, Caligula, the ex-emperor, the last emperor. This is in the, in the reign of Augustus. And um, anyway, this was a very serious charge. Basically, he got caught up in, in a desire by uh, one faction at court to do down another, and uh, uh, so much so that he was exiled to the uh, island of Corsica very suddenly. All of a sudden, he was uh, stripped of all his worldly goods and, uh, and uh, was forced onto this island. And um, you know, what's interesting is just how philosophically he managed to take it, because he, was premedit he had premeditated on this kind of thing. And I think one has to imagine the atmosphere of ancient Rome, perhaps a little bit like modern-day America in terms of the stock market, that one day you could be very rich, but the next day you literally could lose everything. The ground is unstable beneath your feet. And uh, Seneca's philosophy is very much for... It can... It's interesting that it was very popular among uh, wealthy people, among powerful people, because they're people who know the possibility of sudden extreme collapses in their social position. And the circumstances of his death? Uh, basically, he was caught up, uh, I think unfairly, in a, in a plot to kill Nero, uh, whose tutor he had been. Uh, Nero was making himself uh, very unpopular among uh, Romans. He probably went mad uh, and uh, started 
behaving very, very eccentrically, and some army officers decided to try to kill him. Uh, the plot was uncovered, and, and Seneca was implicated in this, and so Nero uh, simply ordered everyone, who even remotely, uh, uh, who he even remotely suspected of being involved, to commit suicide, and that's why uh, he did. Uh, when, when Seneca heard the news that he had to commit suicide, uh, and he told his family. The family started wailing hysterically. Everyone was weeping and shouting, etc. And uh, Seneca urged them to calm down. He said, what need is there to weep over parts of life? He said, the whole of it calls for tears. Uh, and this kind of approach to disaster was very typical of him. Well, you went into some detail about how he died and how long it took and who was there. And it's all depicted in this picture. And as we yeah. do show that picture again, tell that story. Well. Basically, he was surrounded by his wife, Paulina. His wife was his second wife. Uh, she was quite a bit younger than him. Uh, she was very beautiful. And it, it, from all accounts, they really loved one another. And she was absolutely distraught that her husband had been ordered to commit suicide. She very much respected him. He was an eminent philosopher. She couldn't believe that the mad Emperor Nero had, uh, was ordering him to kill himself. So she was completely distressed. And uh, when Seneca started to kill himself, uh, uh, Paulina fainted. And then when she recovered, she took a knife to her wrist and started cu cutting her own wrists um, and uh, and her argument was that she simply couldn't bear to live without her husband um, but her husband told her that you know this was this was ridiculous uh, and tried to get her to 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 accept you know his his death um, and in fact Nero's guards tried to stop uh, uh, Seneca's wife from committing suicide because they didn't wish to add to Nero's already considerable reputation for cruelty. So Paulina did carry on living, but poor Seneca died after a lot of suffering, but he died very bravely, and that's why his death continues to inspire. Before we leave Seneca, um, uh, tell the story of, the, of Cyrus, the king, who had a little disagreement with a river, and, and what's Epicurean about that story? Seneca. Um, or Seneca. Yes. yes. Um, well, Seneca wrote a book called On Anger, in which he considered the extreme actions of many people who are angry and tried to try and understand you know, what was going on there. Uh, one of his favorite examples was uh, the example of uh, Cyrus, the king of Persia, who uh, a few hundred years before uh, Seneca was writing, uh, had decided to uh, invade uh, the Babylonian lands and had uh, raised a huge army from Persia to uh, try and uh, conquer these lands. Um, uh, but uh, when he came across a river uh, that was dividing one half of his territory from the other, um, he came across this very powerful river which he tried to cross. Um, he, uh, he was advised by his advisors not to cross the river because it was very perilous at that time of year. It was foaming and dangerous because of the winter rains. Uh, but uh, Cyrus was a, a very omnipotent man. He thought that nothing should defy his authority. So he said, I will cross this. Uh, and, uh, and what's more, I'll cross it on my favorite white horse. He had a white horse which he loved. So he started crossing and the white horse was taken away by the current instantly as the advisors had predicted and swept downstream to his death. Cyrus was absolutely furious with the river, the river, for, uh, for uh, frustrating his intentions. And he, he decided that the river had done this on purpose, and so he was going to hurt the river for killing his horse. So he ordered his entire army to uh, stop their expedition to, uh, to, 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 to Babylon and divert the river, cut it up into tiny, uh, 360 tiny channels so as to make it so weak that a woman could walk across it, he said, uh, without raising her skirts. Uh, so he wanted to kill the river for punishing, uh, for, 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 he wanted to punish the river for killing his horse. Um, and this is an example of the kind of mad behavior that can seize angry people. Uh, and uh, what Seneca thought that Cyrus was suffering from was a sense of persecution a sense uh, of being mocked and ridiculed and, uh, and that he believed that this is the kind of thing that leads people to feel very brittle whenever something goes wrong and that kind of paranoia um, to suspect that even a river is plotting against you. Uh, he thought that, um, that basically Cyrus was not a friend to himself, he said, and uh, he th believed it was very important to be a friend to oneself if one didn't want to let one's anger get away. Next on the list is a Frenchman, Michael de Montaigne. Uh, He's on the list because he addressed, in your mind, our feelings or our concerns about inadequacy. Who was he? Where did he live and when? Okay, he's a 16th century uh, statesman. Uh, not statesman. Well, he, he, was mayor of, he was mayor of Bordeaux for two terms, but basically he was more of a private citizen. Uh, he lived in the 16th century uh, uh, near Bordeaux in a wonderful castle. And what's interesting about him is that he was very um, modest about... Uh, what it is to be a good human being. Uh, ancient philosophers had kind of suggested that a wise life was quite a heroic thing. And um, 
not only wanted to bring us down to earth and create a more realistic picture of what human beings are like, um, he believed that, uh, that uh, frequently uh, our picture of what it is to be human is simply too exalted. Um, uh, to give you some more sort of concrete examples, he, he, he believes that uh, we're simply not frank enough often about the role of the body in our, in our lives. He asked us to imagine uh, what Plato could have done if he'd been struck by a need to fart at a symposium. And his answer is not very much, uh, that the need to fart is something that even in a great wise man like Plato can completely overpower us. Um, as he put it at another point in his essays, uh, kings and philosophers shit and so do ladies. And he also said that even when we're sitting on the highest throne, we're seated still upon our asses. And he spoke in this very sort of pungent and frank way in order to try and uh, bring home these, these simple but I think very wise and important truths. Why do we even know about him? We know about him from um, a wonderful book which he, he wrote entitled The Essays um, and uh, in this book he uh, undertook a very curious uh, project which was basically to write about himself, to write down his own philosophy of life as it had emerged from his reading and also from his own experience. Um, very few people had been, ever been so personal in a book as Montaigne, but Montaigne thought that uh, all of us um, speak, as it were, from our own bodily selves and from our own experience, and so we mustn't, when we write books, pretend that we're writing from sort of abstract position. This is why Montaigne's book is filled with uh, uh, rather amusing and <coughs> rather touching sort of homey details about him. He tells us uh, when he likes to go to the bathroom, uh, what he likes to eat, his relationship to certain fruits, the fact that uh, he used to like melon but now no longer likes melon, uh, that he likes to brush his teeth a lot. Um, all these kind of details are intertwined with, in discussions about, you know, the great philosophers and history and religion. And uh, really what he's trying to do is to show the interconnection between the high and the low, I suppose. And uh, he's, he's a wonderful guide to reconciling ourselves to, as it were, the extremes of human life, the, the, uh, the ridiculous and the sublime. How does he compare himself with the other philosophers that preceded him? Well, he takes a lot from the philosophers that preceded him. He, he for example, was a great admirer of Seneca. He believed that uh, Seneca was uh, very much to his taste. He, he read him constantly. Uh, he read Epicurus a lot. He loved Socrates. But where he distinguishes himself is his note of skepticism about our powers of mind. He's not as optimistic about someone. Uh, 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 he's not as optimistic as someone like uh, Seneca. He, uh, he, he's aware of just how much we can't control. Uh, he wants to let the farts have their say, as it were. What was the reception of these essays when they were published? Did, were they published during his lifetime? They were published towards the end of his life, and uh, very early on he was recognized as having done something very special, and he's remained uh, a, a figure who almost uh, exemplifies what it is to be a great French writer. I think he's, he's particularly French in his uh, fusion of uh, emotion uh, and reason, uh, in his mixture of um, the everyday and the more exalted. Um, he's uh, He's almost where he lived is a, is a wonderful combination of the north and the south in, in, in all the extremes of temperament, the more rational north, the more sensual south. Uh, Bordeaux is situated between the north and the south, has the climate both of the north and the south, a very temperate climate, and all of these things, I think, influenced Montaigne. He may be French, but he wasn't entirely positive about the French. Uh, you've got a chapter on cultural inadequacy where the French, his countrymen, don't come off so well. What's that about? Well, like all great Frenchmen, he hated France. All great Frenchmen hate France. Flaubert, Proust, they all rant against France. Uh, Stendhal. Um, and yet, um, you know, there's a lot of affection nevertheless. But what he hated about France is, I think, what a lot of people uh, find troublesome about France, which is its chauvinism, the pride that a lot of French people have in their own manners and morals, their belief that they do everything better than anyone else. This enraged Montaigne. And Montaigne did a lot of traveling and believed that traveling is very vital to anyone's education because it helps to release you from a feeling that your own customs are central to the universe. And uh, Montaigne was writing at a time when uh, South America had just been discovered and uh, the customs of the, uh, the, the natives of the Americas uh, were coming in for a lot of ridicule. Uh, they were described as savages, as, as children, as mere animals, and were being slaughtered uh, in their thousands and millions indeed by the, uh, the, the, the Spanish colonists. Uh, Montaigne was a very early defender of um, the, uh, the, uh, the intelligence and humanity and integrity of the natives of the Americas and um, really took the side of the Indians against the Europeans. And, um, you know, this was typical of his 
uh, immense broad-mindedness uh, towards what is new and what is different and uh, really set him apart from his contemporaries. How would his essays of that day compare to memoir today? Well, I think what's, what's interesting uh, about uh, Montaigne is that he's not simply a memoirist in the sense he's not simply telling us his life um, just for, that, for the sake of it. He's a psychologist as well and a philosopher and a historian. He wraps uh, uh, big thoughts in, in the middle of uh, anecdotes about himself. He uses himself really as a springboard to greater, greater thoughts. He's not simply interested in telling us about himself for the sake of it. And there's a note slightly of narcissism in a lot of memoirs written today. This was very far from what Montaigne was doing. He was talking about himself, but in order really to generalize and to discover uh, more about the human condition, um, he, he famously said that each man carries within him the whole of the human condition, so that by studying ourselves well, uh, we have access to really all the possibilities of all human beings. Um, and that's why he thought that he was a fit subject for study. But he was not, he was very self-aware and uh, was not talking about himself simply to puff himself up. Talk about where he wrote and how he wrote. Earlier we showed the audience a picture of a round tower that uh, you were right. to well, as a he, castle. Right. Well, he wrote in a lovely tower um, at one end of his castle. He had the whole tower to himself, and the, uh, the room was given, up to, given over to about a thousand books, which lined the shelves. Was that unusual for that time? Very unusual, for a huge library. Uh, and uh, he had a desk in the middle of the room, and he would do a lot of pacing. And uh, on the ceiling of his uh, room, uh, of his study, he had a number of quotations culled from the classics and from the Bible that were designed to uh, bring him down to earth. So as he would look up at the, these quotations, he would be reminded of the weakness of the human condition. These quotations say things like, um, have you ever seen a man who thinks he's wise? Uh, you have more to hope for from a madman than from him. A quote from Ecclesiastes that was up, up on the wall. Uh, he also had a quote from Plutarch, uh, where, where Plutarch says that everything is too complicated for human beings to understand. So a lot of kind of down-to-earth statements on his study ceiling. His thoughts on education. He believed that education goes wrong a lot of the time, that what we are taught to study and the dominant criteria that we use to evaluate how clever someone is are totally corrupt. Uh, he believed that the youth of France would be better employed playing tennis than uh, going to most schools and universities because he thought that what we are taught at school and university are facts. We are not taught um, the capacity to interpret and to live wisely. And he believed that what wisdom, what knowledge should do is to teach us to be wise. And he thought that this was a, a, a task that education simply had neglected um, in the name of a rather specious focus on um, uh, acquiring knowledge just for its own sake, for snobbish reasons. Now you offer here in, in your book an examination in Montaignan wisdom that is a kind of a test that a school person, school child ought to be given. Is that your own creation or is it directly taken from his writings? I take quotations from, <coughs> from Montaigne because Montaigne says at some point that you know, the examinations that people are set are completely useless. Um, well then give us and, the flavor of right, your right. examination. And so what, I, what, what I do is pick up various examples, um, that for various examples of um, conduct in daily life that Montaigne discusses in his book and um, to which he gives various interpretations. And what I do is use these as a springboard to potential examination questions. So, for example, at one point he talks about a man who's got a very small penis and he's very upset by this and, uh, and uh, runs into all sorts of trouble. And um, what Montaigne tries to, to, to do is to suggest what a man with a small penis might be able to do in order to make his life, life, love life go better. So one exam question is, you know, and he calls, uh, he calls um, a small penis, uh, rather touching, he calls it a small living reality. So in my exam question paper, I ask, well, what should a man with a small living reality do when he finds himself uh, in a bedchamber? The presumption being that this would help him lead uh, or solve the problem in real life. And that, it, well, that this, is a, that this is a legitimate subject of discussion, um, that rather than simply spending years of, of, of our school uh, uh, time and, and, and uh, university years uh, studying very abstract questions, you know, that these are quite urgent questions. The question of a small living reality deserves to be on the syllabus. Is that the overarching theme of his philosophy, bringing it down to the experience we all have on a daily basis. Very much so, very much so, which I think is another reason why he talks so much about himself, to kind of legitimate a, a personal presence in a book. Um, 
You know, he, when he talks about the fact that he likes melon, he doesn't really think we're going to be interested in the fact he likes melon. He believes that it's important for us to bring the melon-eating dimension of ourselves into serious discussions and serious conversation, because that's where they belong. I want to ask you about his thoughts on books, because, well, you'll see why. Uh, he says that um, there are more books on books than on any other subject. All we do is gloss each other. All is a swarm with commentaries of authors there is a dearth. This book, in a sense, is it not a book on books? Mm. And what is he trying to say, and do you fall into his critique? Right. Um, basically, if you went today to a university and you said, uh, I'd like to write a book, I'd like to write a thesis on anger, uh, me and anger, me and when I get angry, you'd be laughed off the stage. If you went to university and said, look, I'd like to write a thesis on Aristotle and anger, fine, the doors would be open. But basically, the dominant system of education allows us to discuss questions, the big questions of life, only via certain authorities. We are only allowed to write commentaries on people. So it's fine to write about things, so long as you do so via a big name. Uh, Montaigne, this was exactly the same situation in Montaigne's day. And Montaigne thought that this was a very depressing situation uh, because what it means that we do is simply concentrate only on what other people have said. We don't analyze ourselves. We always we're reaching it up to the shelf and going, well, what did Aristotle think? What did you know, so-and-so think? And so what he wants us to do is to move from the position of being commentators, i.e. studying other people, to the position of being authors, i.e. people who study themselves as well, of course, as other people, but also themselves. And uh, use their own experiences to come to truths, use themselves as a sounding board. Um, I make this point in my book uh, in a rather ironic way, because as you say, what I'm doing is writing a work of commentary, although I suppose what I'm trying to do, this, this comes at the end of my chapter on Montaigne, is to kind of both free myself and the reader to say, you know, I'm saying, it's, I'm, I'm writing a commentary now, but, you know, let's move on. And, um, and uh, I think Montaigne's point is, you know, is, is immensely relevant. Even today. Do you think that your publisher would have accepted, say you'd followed Montaigne's advice, mm -hmm. he came to you in a dream, and he says, Mr. de Baton, write your own book, write about you, would that book have been published? I think if I'd gone to my publisher and said, uh, you know, I'm going to write about the consolations of my philosophy, yes. uh, I believe they would have been a lot more skeptical. Um, <laughs> there's a general timidity about, you know, an, a, an original authorial voice. Um, we're very afraid to get up there on stage and actually just say what we think, and um, that's what Montaigne wanted to encourage us to do. The next, <clears throat> the next philosopher in your list is Arthur Schopenhauer. He's a consolation for a broken heart. Oh, who was he? Where did he live? Uh, Schopenhauer was a 19th century uh, German who lived in Frankfurt. And uh, he's interesting in that he's one of the first uh, philosophers to really talk a lot about love. You know, what is love? Why do we spend so much time thinking about it? A lot of philosophers have simply neglected this area of life. Schopenhauer, who himself was both uh, obsessed by love and yet had rather unhappy life, I suppose nowadays one would say he had trouble getting a date, um, he spent a lot of time thinking about what love is, <coughs> why, it, you know, why we spend our time worrying about it, etc. Um, he was also rather a pessimist, although I think in an interesting way. Um, the, one of his key insights that he, he begins by asking us to imagine, by asking us to reflect on the fact that we all know people who get together in a relationship with people who they would never have been friends with. And yet they come to us and they say, I'm in love with Joe, with Mary. Uh, and yet we can see from the outside that you know, they, they would not be friends with this person, that this person seems to go against everything they hold dear, etc. Uh, Schopenhauer asks us not to be surprised by this, and he sees this as absolutely central to what love is. He thinks that there are two projects which we're engaged with in life. The project to find people we get on with, the project to have nice, uh, cozy times with people, and that this is the, what we're determined to do at a kind of conscious level. But he believes that unconsciously, we're driven by a blind biological urge uh, to reproduce the next generation, to have children. And he believed that the criteria by which we choose our mate for producing children is very different to what we would ideally choose if we were simply concerned with having a nice time with someone. And that's why it is that we often find people getting together with people who they aren't really friends with. Um, they're doing so for the sake of the children, but they're blind to so, a couple of generations before Freud, Schopenhauer was pointing out that there are largely unconscious reasons why we choose certain people to fall in love with, and that these reasons are not open to us to interpret at a conscious level. And uh, he believed that by understanding the mechanism of love, why it is that we fall in love, we'll be a lot less surprised by love, and a lot less surprised by 
the many difficulties we often have by the way that uh, we can fall very intensely in love with someone and then a few years later once the kids are there and they're running around and we find we have nothing to say to the person seated across the table from us the person who we felt we were so in love with a few years before what's happened um, uh, Schopenhauer would tell us this is actually quite normal sad but normal and um, I think there's a consoling dimension to to this darkness what was his attitude toward divorce if you know well, divorce was not really an option in his day, unfortunately. So Did he address it? He didn't address it because it wasn't a possibility. Um, you talk about his background. What was it? What did he do for a living? Uh, he wrote philosophy books. Um, he had a, a private income, which enabled him to get through. He wanted to join the ranks of academia, but was persistently rejected. People found his philosophy uh, simply not, uh, not what they wanted to hear at the time. Um, so he kept getting turned down. He had a rather lonely, miserable life. Um, he got turned down for many academic posts uh, and just really lived very privately uh, as a you know, as a private scholar in Frankfurt. Um, every morning he'd, uh, he'd get up and uh, go to his club uh, and uh, then he'd have a big lunch and he'd read the Times every morning, the Times of London. He believed it was the paper that would most uh, accurately reflect the miseries of the world, which he felt were legion and needed to be read about. Uh, and he was rather sort of comically gruff and disgruntled. Was he happy? Uh, I think he was, had a kind of twinkle in his eye as he kept telling us that life is totally miserable. Uh, I think he achieved by the end of his life a measure of satisfaction because towards the end his books did become great bestsellers. Did he ever marry? He didn't marry. He had a number of relationships but did, never married. In your book you cite that in 1818 he finishes The World as Will and Representation which he knows to be a masterpiece. It explains his lack of friends. And you quote him, a man of genius can hardly be sociable for what dialogues could indeed be so intelligent and entertaining as his own monologues? That's right. It's typical of his kind of dark, bitter thoughts. I mean, he's saying this with a slight twist of humor. Um, but do it, his, his purported friends take it as such? Uh, I'm not sure. We don't know. We don't know. But, um, but I, think, I think, you know, we have to see him as a man facing huge opposition to his ideas, ideas which are clearly very wise but uh, in his own day met with opposition and I think he, you know, his book sold 230 copies when it came out and uh, he needed some consolation for that. And even then that's not very many books. That's not very many. Um, this idea of him being successful later in life, what is it that put him over the top, so to speak, in terms of his name and rank as a philosopher? Well, he wrote a wonderful book which sadly is out of print called Perega and Paralipomena, not exactly a best-selling uh, sort of title. Nevertheless, this became a bestseller. Uh, it was filled with wonderful considerations on topics of daily life. There was what, an, what does it mean? Uh, it means um, perega. I think it's assortment, assorted thoughts and observations. Is what it means. Um, and uh, and and in the in this book are thoughts on um, uh, what to do about money, uh, fame, uh, women, love, death, suicide. Um, what kind of topics of of everyday life and death um, were addressed and uh, and hit a huge uh, chord in the, uh, the German public and uh, he became a big bestseller was taken up particularly by writers and artists who, who relished him philosophers have always been a little bit suspicious of him but um, but he's always met with, with great approval among uh, people of uh, literary tastes I'm still not sure I understand what it is we take away from Arthur Schopenhauer what his philosophy is that would provide consolation in the case of losing in love let me let me give you a quote which may help to give you the kind of the flavor of what the sort of consolation I mean let's see if you find this consoling you might not do I find it oddly consoling when he tells us that there is only one inborn error and that is the notion that we exist in order to be happy so long as we persist in this foolish inborn error the world will seem to us full of contradictions so much would be gained if through timely advice and instruction all young people could have eradicated from their minds the erroneous notion that the world has a great deal to offer them. So class is in disappointment is what, is what Schopenhauer thought we needed. Um, I read that and I think this is quite fun. Um, I think that there are, you know, very much we live in a culture where, to think, where you think that in order to cheer someone up, what you need to tell them is, you know, life is beautiful, life is great, etc. Schopenhauer more wisely recognizes that sometimes the, what we really need to hear is not life is great, but this is really terrible. Life does seem a bit of a veil of tears. And we can sometimes come away from a dark thinker like Arthur Schopenhauer, weirdly cheered and cheered in a way that we wouldn't be from reading, you know, chicken soup for the soul.
Well, let's analyze that. I understand that you might say, you know, things are pretty bad. So how, and you should accept that, how does that make right. the receiver feel better? Basically, because often what, we, what happens when we feel unhappy is we feel uniquely cursed. We feel that we are unhappy, but the world is beautiful. So this is why people tend to commit suicide at Christmas more than at other times. Why do they commit suicide at Christmas? Because the dominant view of Christmas is everyone's having a good time. And so if you're not having a good time, you think there's really something wrong with me. Now, if at Christmas time we picked up Schopenhauer, we'd be quite consoled because Schopenhauer tells us things like life is pretty miserable. And that helps to correct the often unwittingly cruel optimism that surrounds the kind of you know, the, the sort of vision of what life is like, in which we're all supposed to be smiling and cheerful and everything's supposed to be fine and hunky-dory. Uh, often it can't be, and I think it's nice to pick up a thinker who says, who commiserates with us about how difficult life is, and also who exaggerates slightly. Is it uh, really true that his uh, major work is out of print? The World is Will and Representation, or, or Perega and Paralipomena. Perega and Paralipomena is quite a long book. It's been cut up into, into little books and that now gets sold with titles like The Wisdom of Arthur Schopenhauer, which sort of is in print, but the whole thing is, uh, is out of print. What do you think about books like Ch Chicken Soup for the Soul and the like? Well, I love the idea that a book will in some way help you to feel better. I think this is a very noble ambition of self-help books. Uh, that said, I think most self-help books are a disaster. They're patronizingly written. They hammer home one message. They do so in a, you know, in a very irritating and, 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 and shallow way. So I think I'd like to say that you know, I love the ambition of many self-help books. I think that the execution goes terribly wrong. And what's nice about the philosophers I look at is that what they were doing was writing, I suppose, a superior kind of self-help. That they didn't see... Self-help is a ridiculed genre among people of education nowadays in America. Um, and yet someone like Seneca, a first-rate mind, saw the, the, the writing of books on consolation for poverty or unhappiness as you know, a legitimate intellectual enterprise. And nowadays culture is split into, on the one hand, self-help books which are considered completely trashy, and on the other, uh, academic tomes which are considered and are indeed unreadable. As you know, a lot of these books are huge bestsellers. Uh, do they ultimately do harm? It's very hard to say. I'm sure that some of them, no, I mean, I, I, I'm sure that, you know, many of them do a little bit of good. Um, I just think they could probably do a lot better. Our next philosopher in your book, uh, as a consolation for difficulties, is Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, again, who is he? Where is he from? Okay, uh, he's, uh, he's from Germany as well, uh, also late 19th century. Um, What's interesting about him is that he reads a lot of the ancient philosophers and, uh, and even Schopenhauer and takes objection to one idea in them. The idea that in order to be happy, that the good life is somehow a pain-free life. Um, Aristotle had famously stated uh, that the wise man uh, uh, enjoys a pain-free life. Um, Nietzsche read this and thought it was ridiculous, that he believed that the greatest lives always have a great deal of pain in them. And that if we persist in thinking that there is something wrong with suffering, we'll also cut ourselves off from the chances of fulfillment. And that uh, it's a measure of any good life that it will enjo enjoy, or rather endure, uh, a great deal of pain. Um, so what he wants us to do is to feel sort of more relaxed about the fact that things are difficult. Um, he wants to prepare us for the legitimacy of pain. What if fulfillment comes without pain? Did he accept that as a possibility? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, that's terrific. So if pain is not a requirement for fulfillment. Pain is not a requirement. It's just that very often, I think we have a, a, a kind of pain-free view of fulfillment. I know many people, for example, just to take my own line of work, who write books, who try and write books, and they say, you know, they call me up and they go, well, you know, I tried writing a book, I've written the first chapter, but it's, you know, it's so difficult, I think there's something wrong with it, etc. Uh, Nietzsche says, uh, at some point, let me give you, anyone out there who's thinking of writing a novel, here's some thoughts of what Nietzsche says about how hard you should try to be a novelist, because he thinks pain is normal when you're writing a novel. It's not that the novel is bad, it's that pain is normal. He says the recipe for becoming a good novelist is easy to give, but to carry it out presupposes qualities one's accustomed to overlook when one says simply, I just don't have enough talent. One has to make a hundred or so sketches for novels, none longer than two pages, but of such distinctness that every word in them is necessary. One should write down anecdotes every day until one has learned how to give them the most pregnant and effective form. Well, here's a whole list of all the things we should do. One should continue in this many-sided exercises for ten years at least. What is then created in the workshop will be fit to go out into the world. 
So the philosophy amounted to a kind of curious mixture of optimism and pessimism. Optimism in that all of us can write great books. Pessimism in that it might take 10 years, but that's normal. I want to go back to the uh, photograph of him because you comment on his physical appearance. How did it affect his philosophy and his life? He had a very large moustache, a huge moustache. Uh, he believed that uh, when people saw his moustache, they would believe that he was a, an angry military kind of man. In fact, so this was a purposeful... Uh, no, no, he, he was simply fond of having ni a nice big moustache, but he was aware of how easily people would judge him. And he was you know, made, made rather unhappy by this. But um, he also had a very unhappy love life, trying to pick up various girls, including Lou Andrea Salome, a great beauty of her day, who uh, lots of men were in love with. And she eventually had an affair with Rilke, and Freud was rather taken by her as well. Um, anyway, he, he, he wanted to, uh, to take up with, uh, with Lou, but was rejected, poor man. He is the one who came up with the concept of the Superman. Mm. What does that mean uh, in terms of his philosophy? Really, he sees that um, there are many kinds of lives that are possible, and he believes in a hierarchy of lives. He believes that there are people enjoying more of life than others. He believes in the special existence of a, 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 of a kind of class of people, um, supermen. And this has received rather a, a kind of comic tone, uh, literally comic, because of uh, uh, the, the comic character of Superman. So um, he wasn't, uh, and also it's, it's been associated with a kind of Nazi philosophy. Uh, we see a picture of Nietzsche greeting Elizabeth uh, Nietzsche, uh, Hitler greeting. That, that's Nietzsche's mother. No, that's Ni no, no, that's Nietzsche's sister. Sister, I'm sorry. In, in, in old age, she met uh, 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 Hitler. Hitler was very taken by Nietzsche's philosophy. Um, basically, there's a lot of misunderstanding of what Nietzsche's philosophy was about. It had a rather heroic tone, which attracted the Nazis. Um, in fact, Nietzsche was totally, uh, uh, he hated uh, 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 German uh, nationalism, he hated anti-Semitism, but he was simply misappropriated by the Nazis. Um, what, what, what was key to his idea of the Superman was that there are some lives that are better than others. He didn't have in mind this kind of cartoon character who flies through the air. He believed that someone like uh, Goethe was a Superman, someone like Stendhal, someone like Montaigne was a superman. That is someone who had, as in his words, explored all their possibilities. Someone who had uh, explored their sensual selves, their intellectual selves, their worldly selves, their intellectual selves. Someone who really had feasted from, from life. He also was aware that all these uh, noble and eminent men had suffered a great deal. And he believed that there is a necessary connection between having such a life and suffering, that you simply cannot enjoy what these men enjoyed and uh, be too squeamish, because such lives will uh, require pain. Did he believe that any person could become a superman? No. Um, he believed that, well, as I, I think I said with the same example with the novel, it's a mixture of optimism and pessimism. I, yes, potentially it could happen to all of us, but in practice many of us are simply uh, deniers of, we're simply too squeamish, so that's why we can't. But he's not ranking the quality of human life by saying some can and some cannot, is he? Uh, he is ranking human beings. You know, there's Goethe at the top, and there's some crude Nazi barbarian, there's some crude, let's say, anti-Semite nationalist at the bottom of the pile. Uh, uh, Nietzsche would, would, would hold that assumption. By the way, does this also apply to women, and in terms of all these writers, do women ever factor into the philosophies in a different way than men might? Uh, Schopenhauer was famously caustic about women, uh, um, again in a way that was, I mean, what one finds both in Nietzsche and Schopenhauer is a desire to shock. They were writing in the 19th century an enormously prudish, priggish age, where moralists were constantly uh, praising the forthcoming age of equality of all people and universal happiness and socialist bliss, etc. This enraged both Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, who liked to provoke, they liked to uh, to, to provoke, and they make a lot of provocative statements, which I think have to be taken with a pinch of salt. Uh, some of these were at the expense of women. Um, yeah. Did Nietzsche address women individually then? Uh, he believed that women were on the whole of inferior mental capacities. Yeah. What, is, what do we look to today to his writings? What are the books called and uh, are they still around? Um, people tend to go for a, one of Nietzsche's worst books, Thus Spake Zarathustra. Don't head for that. That's the biggest pile of boring nonsense. But that's nonsense. the only one I'd heard of. Exactly. Don't read that. Why did I hear of that? Uh, I've, it, it achieved kind of popularity in the early 20s in America. It was translated by someone and became kind of popular and whatever. But it, it, it's really an unfortunate thing because it's, it's, 
I don't think his greatest book by any means. What, what does that word, that phrase mean, and what was the book about? Uh, Zarathustra is a kind of allegory of, a, uh, of a, an Indian god, Zarathustra, who comes to earth and tries to rescue human beings. It's a kind of very convoluted account of the Nietzschean good life, um, but done metaphorically and through poetry. Um, it's really uh, almost unreadable and, and, and terrible, in my view. Um, if you want some nice Nietzsche, head for a book called Human All Too Human, uh, which is a selection of aphorisms, which is wonderful. Also read a book called Twilight of the Idols, um, and also a book called Beyond Good and Evil. And these are the books that I center my work on. He wrote about drinking. What mm -hmm. did you think about it? Um, we're drinking water here on C-SPAN. Um, uh, water is the Nietzschean drink par excellence. He said that water suffices, uh, that that in order to be happy, all you need to do is drink water. He was very against alcohol um, for reasons that connect up to his other, the other bits of his philosophy. Uh, his philosophy is based on the idea that you must escape pain, that pain has vital things to teach you. Now what alcohol does, as we all know, is to dull pain. And by dulling pain, Nietzsche believed it also removes the possibility of deeper fulfillment. Um, so, so in the short term, drink makes us feel better, but it removes the possibility of greater fulfillment. Uh, Drink is, in Nietzsche's words, a narcotic, uh, and uh, Nietzsche was very against narcotics. That's why he believed we should drink water, not wine, beer, spirits. You talked, too, about his thoughts on Christianity, which were a little unusual. That's right. Now, he, we're talking about drink. Um, Nietzsche f said at one point, he said there were two, there have been two great narcotics in European and Western civilization. He said, drink and Christianity. And he was anti-Christianity for the same reason as he was anti-drink. He believes that Christianity, in the short term, makes us feel better about a lot of things that are quite unfortunate, being friendless, loveless, poor, intellectually weak, inferior in lots of ways. It brings us great consolation. How does Christianity do that? By praising meekness, weakness. A lot of the New Testament uh, is given over to uh, praising what I suppose one would call, according to worldly values, weaknesses poverty, etc., etc. Um, Nietzsche believed that uh, Christianity is a, a philosophy that denies us fulfillment by trying to dull pain too quickly. Uh, and that's why uh, he believed, um, in a rather ironic jibe, he said at one point that there was only one character who was any good in the New Testament, and that was Pilate, the Roman governor. You talk about him as a consolation for difficulties. Uh, can you relate his overall philosophy to that? If you're facing a difficulty in your life, how would Nietzsche's thinking get you through that? Well, essentially, sometimes we panic about the fact we're in a panic. We, we, we panic that something is quite difficult. We're in the middle of a novel. It's, it's hard to write. We think, oh my God, there must be something wrong with me because it's so difficult. Or, you know, we, we're, we're building up a business and it's very difficult and we think there must be something wrong. Um, what Nietzsche tr tries to tell us to do is, is to see that pain is normal, that pain is a part of um, you know, any fulfilled life, and it has a role to play. And if we escape pain too early, uh, we'll also escape the possibility of fulfillment. Well, what draws you to philosophy? Um, I'm not drawn to all aspects of philosophy. As I said, I think at the beginning, many sides of philosophy are not, not interesting to me. They don't seem relevant. What I'm interested in is those philosophers that I discuss in my book that really connect up to everyday life and that are interested in pursuing wisdom. And that is a, was a mission of philosophy as stated by Socrates back in ancient Athens. But it's not a mission of philosophy that, any, that many university professors recognize today. We should mention to those who don't already know that you've also, you are the author of another book called How Proust Can Change Your Life. This is the paperback version. Uh, is Marcel Proust a philosopher? Well, no. He, he, well, he's a philosophical novelist. Um, his novel is filled with, with ideas. Um, and, um, but, but essentially, I think, you know, I think he does work within the frame of a novel. But, uh, but he has a definite philosophy of life, and it's that philosophy of life that I was interested in tracing in How Proust Can Change Your Life. And this was a very successful book, mm -hmm. um, bestseller, in, in fact. Um, what do you think people got out of your story of how reading Proust can change one's life? I think they got a sense of a, a, a kind of the a road map for Proust, a sense of what the values are in Proust's work. So um, it's not a summary of Proust's book, that would be 
stupid even to attempt, but what it is is an attempt to uh, delineate what Proust's philosophy of life and of happiness is. It's really, what is the point of life for Proust? And I do that by looking at his novel and his letters and his own life. And so it's a kind of, it's a vision of, of what, 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 what things Proust values. And what do you want, or how do you want people to use this book, The Constellations of Philosophy? I think to uh, see just how much the philosophers, the six philosophers I look at, have to, to say to us that is relevant to today, and um, to see that philosophy is not necessarily always the dry, uh, turgid subject which many of us have experienced um, either at first hand or, or, or by loose acquaintance, then that there are certain philosophers who really speak from the heart to us today. But not all of them are consolations necessarily, and I just name a bunch that aren't on your list. Mm. Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Russell. Mm. They're not on your list for some reason. They don't fall into a category. Mm. And what is that category? Well, I mean, there are so many people missing from my book because I'm only looking at six people. So, you know, I often get asked, well, there's no one here from the 20th century. What have you got against the 20th century? What, what and do you I have say, against and I the say, 20th century? And I say nothing. What have I got against the 14th century? There's no one there either. And the 11th century, no one. 10th century. So it's really, it's six essays on six key philosophers. Um, it's, it's not a comprehensive study of all of philosophy. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're looking for a general um, kind of cozy introduction to philosophy, this is not it. This is really a, a quite, um, you know, it's a, more, it's a personal study of six philosophers who I believe really matter. And your next book? It's at that early stage, so rather like pregnancy, it's wise not to talk about it too soon. In that case, we'll conclude our discussions of the Constellations of Philosophy by Alain Dubouton. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks very much.